What the market does doesn't matter. What matters is you, the real estate investor, adapting to the market, right? If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to the Weekly Juice Podcast, where we discuss all things real estate, personal finance, investing, entrepreneurship, and the many ways to achieve financial independence. We interview accomplished investors and entrepreneurs with the goal that their stories inspire you to take control of your financial future. Here to get your creative juices flowing while also documenting their own personal investing journeys are your hosts, Corey Jacobson and Ryan Bevilacqua. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice. As always, it's your boys, Ryan and Corey here with another episode. Today, we had the pleasure of interviewing Jay Connor. He is a real estate investor out of North Carolina. He's been in the biz since 2003 and has rehabbed over 450 homes. That averages $78,000 per deal. Um, he mentions he does a lot of flips right now. We also got into talking a lot about sub two and creative financing, which was fun. Um, but he consults one on one with investors and aspiring investors on how to become private money lenders. Yeah, people need to get ready for some Southern energy in this episode. Uh, he has maybe the best intro that we've heard, if not all time, in the last hundred episodes or so. He really has this like we we call it a charisma, like this just a spark. He's a great salesman, but. One of the things that Jay talks about is his story about how in 2003, four, five, all the way up to 2007 and eight, he had a, a, a real estate business that had a, a home equity line or a line of credit for his business that was up to a million dollars. And it just got shut down by the bank when the financial crisis happened. And, and, and Jay talks about his response to that. And it immediately within 90 days, he was able to raise privately $2 million, over $2 million. And that just sparked the rest of his journey of like going from using traditional bank financing to using private money. And Jay lives in a town or a community of 40,000 people. So it's not like he has this huge, massive network of, and he's in a big city. Like he did this in his backyard in North Carolina and, you know, he makes $70,000 per deal. And I just want people to listen to the way he talks, the way he communicates. He's so precise and succinct and he's just got a great personality and it was just fun to listen to him i was like on the edge of my seat like waiting for the next one liner or thing that he was going to say it just made me uh it was just a fun like happy episode i guess totally and it made me think about if i was on the receiving end of this or like in in a pitch for becoming a private money lender or wanting to lend my money out to someone the confidence he exudes but also the knowledge of the industry and then the energy he's likable he's yes. easy to trust maybe it's the southern thing i don't know what it was but he knew his stuff. He's been in the business for a very long time. He's got a great story. He wrote a book. He offered a bunch of freebies for our listeners if you wait till the end. So I think overall, you guys are going to really like this episode. It was a burst of energy. And without further ado, I think we bring in Jay. When you have investment properties and tenants, you need a good system in place for collecting rent to make it easy as possible. And Rent Ready can help you with everything. When you sign up for Rent Ready, you can start adding your properties, inviting tenants, and creating charges. You can even set up automatic rent reminders and create auto late fees as well. For tenants, they can pay via ACH, card, or even cash using Rent Ready's web and mobile apps. They can also use an automatic payment setup and sign up for rent reporting so they get rewarded for paying rent on time. Rent Ready saves you time and hassle by automating rent collection, and you can manage everything from one dashboard. For our Weekly Juice listeners, Rent Ready's given us a special 50% off for any Rent Ready plan using our code Weekly Juice at rentready.com. That's R E N T R E D I.com using the code Weekly Juice. That's W E E K L Y J U I C E to save 50% off any Rent Ready plan. Jay, officially welcome to the Weekly Juice podcast. Corey and I are so excited to have you on the show. We just talked a little bit pre recording about a lot about um, raising private money. And I think you have an amazing skill set to share with our listeners. And we're really excited to hear the backstory of how you got into real estate. So we appreciate you joining us. Absolutely, Ryan and Corey. Let me tell you, I'm so excited to be here with you. And I'll tell you why. My lands 
private money has had more of an impact on my real estate investing business than any other strategy, any other technique that I've learned when I was cut off from the banks. It was the biggest blessing in disguise. For goodness sakes, in less than 90 days, I uh, raised $2,150,000 after losing my line of credit. But um, you were asking about how I got started in real estate and, and that type of thing. Well, I was actually raised in a family, my father, that was in the housing business. My dad, he's 90 years old now, just had his big 90th birthday party, and um, he was in manufactured housing. He was the largest retailer of manufactured homes, mobile homes, if you will, for decades and decades. So I was always around uh, the um, industry and the company of helping people own a home. I was just focused in affordable housing. Well, way back in 2003, the uh, financing for that product went away. The whole industry fell out of favor with Wall Street. Well, I knew if I ever got out of um, manufactured housing and mobile homes, I wanted to get into single family houses. So for the first six years, from 2000, um, for the 2003, all the way to, to January of 2009, I relied on the local banks to fund our deals. Uh, uh, single family deals. I've done commercial as well, shopping centers, et cetera. But the focus has been on single family houses. So for the first six years, all I knew to do to get my deals funded, my real estate deals funded was to go to the local bank, get on my hands and knees and put my hands underneath my chin and beg and say, please fund my deal, you know, and give financial statements and verification of income and all that kind of stuff. And so anyway, that's all I knew to do. Well, the biggest blessing in disguise came along January 2009. Now, I know, Corey and Ryan, it may be hard for you to believe, but here in eastern North Carolina, we still have handsets and cords that are attached to them. It's, <laughs> it's called a landline telephone. Anyway, I was sitting here at my desk, and I called up my banker, January 2009, and here's where the pivot happened. I called him up. I told him about these two deals that I had under contract, these two single family houses uh, to fund. And I had a line of credit there. At least I thought I still had a line of credit there. And I found out very quickly on that conversation that my line of credit had been shut down with no notice. And I sat here and I thought to myself and I said, Steve, I said, what do you mean my line of credit is closed? I've had a great relationship with you in the bank for six years. He says, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? I said, no, but now I've got a financial crisis. I got these two deals under contract, over $100,000 in profit, no way to fund them. So I, I, I shut down the phone there uh, with Steve, and I thought here for a moment, and here's a rider downer. By the way, these people that go around and say every problem you got is an opportunity, I want to throw up. I didn't have no problem. I mean, no opportunity. I had a problem, right? Yeah. So yeah. I sat here and I asked myself a question. I said, who do I know that can help me with my problem? And so, I mean, I had a choice. I could have quit. I could have gone to the house, you know, and uh, but that wasn't my, one of my choices. And so immediately I thought of my friend, Jeff, who lived in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time. He was investing in real estate. I told him what had happened. He said, well, Jay, welcome to the club. I said, what club? He said, the club of being shut down at the bank. I just lost my line of credit last week. I said, well, Jeff, how are you going to fund your deals? He says, have you ever heard of private money? I said, no. He says, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? I said, no. And so I studied private money, what it is, what it was. And I studied how to use sell, how people can use their retirement funds to be a private lender, uh, how they can use their investment capital to be a private lender. And so I simply started sharing, first of all, with people in my own network, people I went to church with, people at the Rotary Club, people in my cell phone. I just started sharing with them my private lending program. In other words, I started sharing with them how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely. So what did I do? I didn't ask anybody for money. You know, the traditional way of borrowing money is you go to the bank, get on your hands and knees, and you ask and you apply. In this world of private money, there's no asking, no begging, no selling, no persuading. You're not asking for a mortgage, you're offering a mortgage, right? So what did I do? I put on 
I put on my teacher hat, right? So my teacher hat says private money teacher. So here's the deal. So many times new real estate investors will say to me, they'll say, Jay, I'm fear of rejection. You know, I'm afraid nobody's going to loan me money. And here's the deal. And here's another rider downer. How can you be rejected if you're not asking for anything? You see, we separate the conversation with a new potential private lender of, here's how you can earn high rates of return safely and securely. By the way, the whole program is in my book that I'll give your audience for free. But here's the interest rate we'll pay. Here's how you're protected. Here's how you can get your money back early in case of an emergency. And so we just share the program. And so when they say, yay, I love the program, or they've got retirement funds, well, I'll introduce them to our self-directed IRA company that we recommend to get their retirement funds moved over so they can be a private lender. So I never, you see, desperation has got a smell to it. I never, I've never pitched a deal. I never talk about private money in a first conversation with a new potential private lender, and I got a deal. Like the worst time to be looking for private money is when you got a deal under contract. That's why I say, get the money first. Get the money lined up first. There's always going to be deals. So then when we've got a deal to get funded, we simply pick up the phone. We call the private lender that's already told us how much money they've got that they want to invest. And I'll call them up and I'll tell them four things. So here's another writer down. Or what four things do I tell the private lender that's waiting for the phone call? First thing I tell them is I say, this is what we call the good news phone call. This is the good news phone call. I got good news for you. I can now put your money to work for you. See, they've been waiting for the phone call, right? I can put the money to work for you. And then I'll tell them four things. I'll say, I got a house in Newport. So I tell them where the property's located, the area. I'll tell them the after repaired value. I'll tell them the money that's required for the deal. I know they got the money. They already told me they got the money waiting on the phone call. And then I tell them when the closing date is. And, you know, typically that's about a week out and they'll wire their funds. So, for example, Corey, let's say you're one of my new private lenders and you've told me you've got $150,000 to use. I call you up and say, Corey, I've got great news. I can now put your money to work. I've got a house in Newport with an after repair value of $200,000. The funding required for it is $150,000. And uh, the closing is going to be next week, next Tuesday. You'll need to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney by next Monday. That's the end of the conversation. I didn't ask the private lender if they want to do the deal. That's the most stupid question in the world I could ask them. Of course they want to do the deal, particularly if they've moved the money from their retirement funds over to a self-directed IRA. They're not going to make any money until you do put the, you're morally and ethically bound to put their money to work if you've showed them this and now they're waiting for the good news phone call. So no asking, no begging, no chasing. It's all about serving and offering. And as a result, the money's chasing you instead of you chasing the money. Well, Jay, I don't know if we've had an uh, an introduction or an opening uh, statement, if you will, as as um, as charismatic charismatic as that. So, thank you very much. We appreciate <laughs> it. I think I'm curious. You know, did you always? I don't want to use the word salesman as like a, a sleazy thing because that's not what I mean. Because we're sales guys. Have you always known that you had this ability to be able to? You're saying you're not persuading. I totally understand that, but to to get people to know, like, and trust you. Do you have, has that ability, when did that ability come? Because I could tell within the first five minutes of hearing you, I'm ready to, uh, to wire you some cash. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it, it, that's a good thing. I'm curious, like out of the desperation that you, that you had, you had this problem. When did you know that you had the ability or how long did it take you to realize you had the ability to go raise money from people that were just in your community? So as I said, I didn't ask anybody for money, but let me tell you what I did ask for. So I'm so glad you asked the question this way. So the best way to teach this and share it to your audience is to tell a short story as to how I got my first $250,000 private lender. So, uh, you know, as I said, I got the phone with Jeff. So I, first of all, I had to put my program together. What do I mean by that? I had to decide what interest rate was I going to offer? Um, how, you know, how could they get their money back early in case there was, uh, they had some kind of emergency. Well, I decided I'm going to put in the promissory note a 90-day call option so they can give me 90 days to 
you know, get their money back in case of an emergency. So, so I put, you know, what's the length of the note going to be? Well, I decided I was going to make the length of the notes two years. Okay. So I, so I put my program together. And so then here's what I did. This is called the indirect method conversation, the indirect method. So here's how it goes. It was on a Wednesday night at 730. My wife, Carol Joy, and I, we were on our way to Bible study here on Barber Road in the Church of Christ. And so we get there, and I knew who I wanted to talk to after Bible study on Wednesday night. So I walked in the foyer, and I walked up to the gentleman. His name was Wayne. I walked up to Wayne, and I said, Wayne, I said, I've got something that I'd like to talk with you about confidentially after Bible study tonight. Would you be available to get together for a few minutes? He said, sure. So we had Bible study, and Bible study's over, and so we get together in the nursery after, after Bible study. I shut the door, and here's exactly what I said to Wayne. I said, Wayne, you know everybody in this community. And he did. He was the original Zenith television dealer in Moorhead City, North Carolina. And if you don't know who the Zenith television dealer was or is, then you don't remember life before Walmart come into town because you actually went to the Zenith television dealer to buy your TVs before Walmart. So I said, Wayne, you know everybody. You've installed a television in everybody's house here in, in the local community. You're in the Rotary Club. You're connected everywhere. I said, Wayne, I need your help. And I said, Wayne, I've now opened up my real estate investing business to people I know and trust, and it's by referral only. I'm paying insane high rates of return. And so here's what I need your help with, Wayne. When you run across somebody and they're complaining about the volatility of the stock market, losing money in the stock market, or they're complaining about the stupid low rates they can get at the local bank in the form of a certificate of deposit, would you refer them to me and I'll tell them about my private lending program? Well, what do you think Wayne said? Wayne said, yep. well, now... Brother Jay, what you talking about? What kind of rates are you paying? And I said, well, that depends on the deal. I said, um, but are you saying you and your wife might be interested? He said, well, yeah, we might be interested. We're making only 3% in the local CD, and that's what the rates were back in 2009. He says, and we're losing money, the stock market, the, you know, it's volatile all over the place. Um, he says, you know, what kind of rate are you paying? And I said, uh, well, what sounds high to you? And he said, well, we're getting 3% in the local bank. He said, I don't know, I guess 5% sounds pretty high. I said, well, Wayne, I can't pay you 5%, but I can pay you 8%. He said, put me down for $250,000. So I went to his home, his and his wife's home, the next day afternoon, and I went over the private lending program, which is in my book, How to Teach a Potential Private Lender, how your program works, what's the right. Now, notice I'm not talking any deal. Also notice I'm not bringing up those other two deals that I've got under contract, right, that are still hanging out there that I don't have funded. Because, you see, even if you are not trying to sound desperate, if you talk about private lending to someone that's never done it and you got a deal that needs funded, you're sounding desperate without even trying to sound desperate. So we separate those conversations of the program. So they pledged nothing to sign. They pledged $250,000. So then three days go by. I, I, I was patient. Three days go by. And I called up Wayne with the good news phone call, right? And I told him about this, the house that I had. Well, I actually told him about one house. I didn't tell him about the other one. And so you see that how important that process is uh, because we want to separate offering an opportunity, right? with actually having a deal for the private lender to, to fund. And I'll tell you, today I've got, here's something interesting. Today I've got 47 private lenders, individuals that are funding mine and Carol Joy's deals. And you know what? Not one of them had ever heard of private money or private lending uh, or self-directed IRAs. And by the way, there's another right or downer actionable item establish a relationship with a self-directed IRA company so that when you're talking with someone and you find out they've got retirement funds and they're interested in getting higher rates of return safely and securely, 
then you've got somebody to refer them to to talk about how what's that look like of moving retirement funds over to a self-directed IRA company. So having these relationships in place are so important as well. Totally. Um, can you talk to the types of deals that private money is good for? I know there's a multitude out there, but for example, you mentioned you had a couple in your back pocket. It's obviously good to get the money first. It's worse that we've established that, but it's also what kind of deals are you finding or strategy are you using to find that spread, right? So you can pay back the private money lender, but then also you make a little bit on your back end sure. as well. So on the single family house, so, so you raise private money for different types of real estate projects, right? My, I mean, I've done shopping centers, but my focus um, for uh, ever since, really my focus since 2003 has been single family houses. So our average profit right now is $78,000 per house. So obviously, for us to make those kind of profits, we got to be buying these houses at a discount, right? So typically, we are, so I'm not going to borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value. I didn't save the purchase price, big difference. So I'm not going to borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value. So for example, if I'm, you know, considering and making an offer on a house that's got a after repaired value of $200,000, well, I'm not going to borrow more than 150, but let's say that house needs 30 or $40,000 in rehab to make it absolutely beautiful and I'm going to flip it. So in this market today, I'm flipping most of the houses. However, if I buy a house, side note, if I buy a house on terms with creative financing, which I know you all know a lot about as well, if I'm buying a house on terms subject to the existing note, seller financing, et cetera, then typically I'm going to sell it on terms, right? I'm not going to cash out. So buy, my, my criteria or rule of thumb is buy on terms, sell on terms. Pay all cash with private money or your own cash, cash out. Because I don't want a bunch of cash, whether it's private money or my own cash, buried in a property. But back to what I was saying. After repaired value of $200,000, I'll borrow up to $150,000. Maybe it's got thirty dollars or forty dollars in rehab needed. Well, I buy $200,000 after repaired houses all day long for eighty dollars to $100,000 because we have a motivated, and, you know, a, a motivated seller and a distressed property. So most of them are... Uh, single family houses. Uh, but in addition to that, you can use private money, raise private money for syndication. I know you guys have done that. And so the difference is you're going to syndicate or raise money uh, from private lenders to invest in a fund, typically, for your larger projects, commercial deals, apartments, et cetera. Um, but everything that we do with private money in this world of single family houses is what we call one-offs, one-offs. So these private lenders are not investing in a fund. They are getting a promissory note and a deed of trust or a mortgage. So we're not borrowing unsecured money. And their their investment, right, is backed by the real estate that I'm buying. Real quick, I know Corey has one, but I want to jump in here. You mentioned the 8% return. Is that standard across all of your deals? Or do you offer, to, you know, maybe if there's a larger spread, maybe a higher percentage. You know, 8% is great. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, if you're an investor out there, obviously a nice 18%, 12 to 18% would be a little bit sexier. Now, I don't know where you're finding that. I'm just, you know, your hands are in the weeds, right? So you can kind of manipulate these deals based on your skill set. I'm just curious if you ever offer any higher and maybe what strategy would be implemented there. Is it still a flip or maybe you bought it at the right price? Maybe give some insight there. Sure. So, um, I have discovered and observed over all these years, private lenders talk among themselves, <laughs> all right? So, and a lot of our private lenders know each other, okay? Rotary club, go, go to church together, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and so they talk. So I, I, I established at the very beginning of, of getting into this that I was going to pay them all the same. I was going to pay them all the same. That's why when Wayne told me he was happy with 5%, and I said, well, Wayne, I can't pay you 5 but I can pay you eight. I had already established what I was going to offer. By the way, no points. I never paid any points or origination fees to a private lender. Never paid any extension fees, right? So I pay a straight 8%. It's been the same since 2009. And, you know, 
interest rates have been all over the place since 2009. Mm -hmm. I mean, before COVID, the local certificate of deposit at the local bank got down uh, to a quarter of a percent. Well, as of today in this market, you know, you can go get 5% in a 12-month CD. But but here's the deal. 8% is still a whole lot better than 5%, right? Sure. Yep, so, so, I, so I've kept it all the same. And then I don't have to remember how much am I paying that one and how much am I paying that one. And so I'm glad you asked this question, uh, Ryan, and that is, you said, have I ever offered them, you know, a high rate or a percentage of the deal on the back end? And the answer is no. That's joint venturing. Nothing wrong with joint venturing. I know a lot of people that joint venture with their private letters and, you know, give them a piece of the action on the back. But I decided at the uh, at the very beginning, the private my private letters are going to be just like the bank, just like the bank. They were going to know exactly what return they were going to get. And then, you know, they were going to be the bank. So really quick. Sorry. Uh, you're good. <laughs> I just want to. Just paint the picture for someone listening. I'm sure we got a lot of people driving in the car thinking about this, and we'll, we'll make a basic one so it's not a ton of numbers. But like, say for example, someone gives you 100 grand, and you're going to dump that into a deal, and you're promising an 8% return. Is your timeline typically 12 months? So at the end of 12 months, they're getting 8,000 bucks, and it's a lump sum. Can you just talk about plus their principal? Yeah, plus plus the 100 grand. Back. Yeah, 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 exactly. So sure. they're coming out with 108. I'm just curious on how the timeline works. Sure. So it depends, obviously it depends on the property. So most <laughs> of our rehabs that we're doing on single family houses these days, most of those are ranging in the forty to $50,000, right? But I just finished a rehab that was uh, $175,000, just a rehab. That was very out of the ordinary, very out of the ordinary. So I do the notes for two years, but typically, typically in this market, you see, I may have a house sit there after I buy it for three months before I get any of my crews or my contractors there to rehab it. So the clock is ticking. The private lender starts earning interest from the date of closing. And they only get the interest earned for the time period that I'm using the money. So there's no penalty for me to pay off the note early if we get the deal done. So in today's market, I'm typically in a deal and out of a deal within nine months or so, right? From the time the rehab starts until it's finished, which the rehab, how long does the, long does the rehab take? Rehab's going to typically take about two to three months, depending Perfect. on the extent. Sort of my rule of thumb is, is your contractor, if you're doing a rehab, should, um, should uh, uh, use up about $7,500 a week, 15000 in uh, two weeks, right? Um, as, as just sort of a gauge. So right now in this market, about nine months. Now, when do they get paid? When does the private lender get their, get their interest money? So I leave it up to the uh, private lender. I've got some elderly private lenders that need the monthly payment income because that's what they're living off of. They don't want to touch their principal investment amount, but they're living off of that. So I'll pay them monthly interest payments. By the way, I always bring home a big check when I buy. Always bring them a big check because I bought, I always borrow more than I need to buy. And so anyway, some get monthly payments. But if I'm doing, you know, a flip in six or nine months and the person doesn't need the monthly payments, then we'll just let the interest accrue. Okay. And then when we cash out, They'll get all of their principal investment back and the interest that they've earned during that period of time. So this 8% that I pay is an annual percentage rate. But if I'm in and out in nine months, they're not going to get $8,000 on $100,000. They're going to get $6,000 because I only used it for that period of time. Now, of course, the private lender is going to want me to get that money put back to work just as soon as possible because they're not earning any money unless it's invested. Sure. This is perfect. You mentioned, I want to go back to what you said, Jay. You mentioned something about getting a, pay, a payday or a check when you buy. I'm curious if this has anything to do with ca how you cash three big checks on every real estate deal. Can you talk about, that seems, uh, that sounds sexy, and, and I'm really curious about how you structure deals to allow yourself to do that. Absolutely. So let's go back to the same example Say we've got a house that's got an after-repaired value of $200,000. Well, 
And again, that same example, got a rehab, say, of, you know, $30,000 for easy figures. And I buy those houses all day long for 200000 So let's say I, excuse me, 100000 So let's say I, I say 50% of the after-repaired value, right? I mean, when I hear after-repaired value of 200000 I'm immediately thinking I'm buying this house between seventy dollars and $100,000, right, for the, for the average rehab. So follow the money. So follow the money. How do I get that first big check? Remember, I can borrow up to 75% of the after-repaired value. Well, the after-repaired value is 200000 So, um, Corey, I'm going to put you on the spot. Here's your first test question. Here's your first mm -hmm. math test question. Yep. I got an after-repaired value of 200000 Yep. I'm borrowing 150000 so the private lender is wiring that $150,000 to my real estate attorney's trust account. I'm buying it for $100,000. After repaired value, two hundred. dollars I'm borrowing one hundred and fifty dollars at closing. I'm buying it for $100,000. How much is my big check when I buy? Sounds to me like it's $50,000. That's exactly what it is. It's $50,000 yeah. less closing cost, right? Right. Less closing cost. So in that example, I'm bringing home a $50,000 check when I buy and taking no money of my own to the closing table. Let me tell you my favorite phrase on my real estate attorney's uh, check stub that I pick up is excess cash to close. And let me tell you something, I love me some excess cash. And <laughs> I mean, there's nothing more fun. You stop and think about it. You buy, I mean, raise your hand if you want to get paid to buy houses, right? We'll and both take raise your hands if you're watching on YouTube. <laughs> we're, we're all raising our hands. <laughs> Take none of your own money to the closing table and get a big old fat check. Well, how did that work? After that, that does not work unless you're buying at a discount, right? That's not working. If you, you know, on creative financing and buying subject to the existing note, shoot, if if the house is in good condition, you can pay 100% retail value if you're going to turn around and sell it on terms. But anyway, back to the three checks. So I got a big check when I buy, when I'm paying all cash. Now, if I decide to sell it on terms, in this market, I'm not, if I've got cash in it. But if I sell it on terms, I can get a large non-refundable lease option deposit. The legal term is actually an option fee. So I could get a second check in the middle of the deal if that was my exit strategy. But I'm at least going to get another check when I cash out. Well, how much? Uh check am I going to get if I sell it at 200000 after repaired value and I still owe the private lender 150000 Remember, we borrowed $150,000. We're, letting the, uh, uh, we're not paying down any of the principal. By the way, that's a win-win for the private lender and you, the borrower, the real estate investor. They make more money if you don't pay principal and interest if there are monthly payments. And if you're making interest-only payments or just letting it accrue interest, they're making more money because they're letting all of their principal stay invested in the deal. So back to it closing, how big of a check do I get when I close? I sell it for $200,000. Uh, I still owe the private lender $150,000. Well, I'm going to get a $50,000 check less any accrued interest that I need to pay. If I listed it with a realtor, less realtor fees, right? So fifty thousand. If I'm paying my realtor a realtor fee, that'd be less a uh, ten thousand. So now I'm down to forty, and then you know maybe a little bit of accrued interest that's part of a month of interest. So I got a fifty thousand dollar check when I bought less closing costs. Did I get to keep most of that money? No. No. Most rehab. of that first. That's the rehab. Yeah. Right. Most of that money went to rehab. Thirty thousand, thirty-five, forty thousand. Maybe I only kept ten thousand out of that check. Do I get to keep most of the money when I sell it and cash out? And the answer is yes. I'm keeping most of that fifty thousand dollar check, less my realtor fees if I listed it, and and you know less you know less any closing cost. Got it. It's great. So that makes perfect sense. My question was actually going to be, are you paying majority of that first check to the rehab? But it sounds like you answered that. So thank you. You are. So this this system that you have is 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 awesome. How are you finding some of these deals? And do you have a specific buy box that is like, okay, uh, you know, I buy three bed, two baths in X in, in X place in North Carolina. Like what is the way that you're finding these deals so that you 
can have this consistent pipeline for the private money lenders to make a return. Over to you, your entity, whatever entity you're buying in, and you, the buyer, real estate investor, you are agreeing to make their monthly payments. Now, subject two is not assuming a loan. Assuming a loan means that the lender the, or that's got that mortgage is now approving you, the buyer, to take over that loan. That's an assumption. Subject two is not an assumption. In fact, the lender's got nothing to do with the deal of you buying it subject to. Those numbers work out okay, right? Yes, they do. So how am I, how am I finding these? So what's my buy box? I'll buy any single family house here in my local area, so I made a business decision. I don't want to invest outside of my area. I got a lot of good friends who do virtual investing. Uh, I got a lot of wholesaler friends that do virtual investing. But I made a, you know, I've never wholesaled a deal in my life. I know how to wholesale a deal, but um, I like 78000 better than twelve or 15000 on wholesale. But anyway, so I buy here locally. I will buy any house. Our median price point, by the way, is right at 325000 is our median price point. I'll buy any house up to an after-repaired value in today's market of $1 million. So, uh, and, you know, we're in a resort area, so we got homes on the beach. We got houses here on the mainland. So the most expensive home I've done had an after-repaired value of $900,000, and that was a couple of years ago. I just bought one last week. After repaired value of $525,000, I closed on it with private money for $325,000 under rehabs, only $50,000. So I'll buy up to a million dollar after repaired value. I don't care how many beds or baths. Single family, I'll also do condominiums. I'll do townhomes. I'm not going to do duplexes. I'm not going to do duplexes unless I'm able to buy that on terms and then either rent it out or sell it on terms, but cashing out, not many people want to buy a duplex. So sort of my, my buyer pool is lower. But let me give some advice based on experience to 2003. I keep the majority of my deals that I buy, I keep the majority of them around the median price point, and here's why. That's where most of your buyers are when you're going to sell a house. Most of your buyers, first-time mm. home buyers, are around that medium price point. So I want to be able to sell it really, really fast. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, can you? You mentioned subject to existing mortgage and um, sub to briefly here. Can you talk about? Let maybe just give us an example of a deal you've done or one that we can educate listeners on what sub to is and how you'd buy and exit using the same strategy. Maybe owner finance um, woven within your call, but just. A simple one like we've been going through. Sure. So, of course, buying subject to means that the seller of the property, so you're only going to buy subject to when you're dealing directly with the owner of that property for sale by owner. So buying subject to means that the seller of the property is willing to sell you their house, transfer title, deed, and ownership over to you, your entity, whatever entity you're buying in, and you, the buyer, real estate investor, you are agreeing to make their monthly payments. Now, subject two is not assuming a loan. Assuming a loan means that the lender the, or that's got that mortgage is now approving you, the buyer, to take over that loan. That's an assumption. Subject two is not an assumption. In fact, the lender's got nothing to do with the deal of you buying it subject to. It's already on line 204 of the HUD settlement statement. Uh, your real estate attorney, they don't even have to create anything to make this happen. It's already there. So you buy it subject to the existing note. Now you own the property. The mortgage stays in the seller's name, and you're making the payments on that until you eventually cash out or sell it or, or what have you. Now, the interesting thing about buying subject to is you're able to combine private money strategy with subject to strategy. So how's that work? You can buy a house subject to the existing note. In fact, you can buy any kind of real estate subject to the existing note, but most of the time it's single family houses. Well, if there's enough equity in the property and you bought it at enough of a discount, you can borrow a smaller amount of private money. Maybe it needs some repairs. You know, maybe it needs 
20,000 or 30,000 in repairs. You want to fix it up really nice or whatever. Or maybe you're buying a foreclosure directly from the person that's a for sale by owner. Well, guess what? If they're in foreclosure, they're behind on payments, obviously. So you can buy that foreclosure subject to the existing note. And then you can use private money, a smaller amount of private money in second position, also known as a junior lien position, and put that in second position. The private lender still gets their own note, still gets their own mortgage or deed of trust to collateralize their note. And now you use that private money, smaller amount, to bring past payments current, you know, do some minor yeah. rehab if it needs it. I've used that strategy a lot, right? When I'm not wanting to dig into my own pocket, buy subject to, and if there's some cash needed, I can put a twenty or $30,000 small amount of money in second position. Got it. So with, with sub two, what is the benefit to the seller? Maybe they're in a, you know, a, a pinch, right? I guess my assumption here is they are not behind on payments. Maybe they're struggling to make their payments. You're taking over their payments, right? But how do you agree on a price to get a spread there? And then what's your exit strategy if you're going to like roll that into a new, you know, maybe owner finance to someone else coming to buy it in or at least to at least the own option. I'm trying to figure out like the next stage here. Sure. Well, it depends on it depends on their motivation and why they're wanting to sell. Invariably, almost 100% of the time, they are looking the seller that will sell to you subject to the existing note is looking for debt relief. They're looking for debt relief. For whatever reason, making that monthly payment is giving them a heartache. So either they are personally uh, in financial straits for whatever reason, somebody died, somebody lost a job, somebody got a divorce. For some reason, they can't afford that monthly payment anymore, right? And they're or, or they're needing to move, and they're needing to move quickly. That's a great thing about private money and buying subject to the existing note. You can I, all my offers. I tell I can close. I put in right, and I can close in seven days. Seven days. And here's another thing: when I'm buying, uh, they can't get out that fast, right? So I will allow them to stay in the house for an agreed upon period of time, and I will give them half of the cash that's coming to them. Now, if they're selling for what they owe, obviously there's there's no cash there coming, but if they're in foreclosure, I always give them three or four thousand dollars to help them get back on their feet. For goodness sakes, if my average profit is seventy-eight thousand dollars, can I not help somebody in distress get back on their feet, even if they they will sell for what the payoff is? So yep. that's a beautiful thing of being able to use the private money with the subject to strategy. Makes sense, and so debt relief is really the is the answer of when subject two comes into debt play. Debt relief. Yeah, Dead so relief. that's that's perfect. So Jay, um, you know anybody that's done something for 20, 20 plus years, uh, there's some resilience that comes into play, uh, especially having gone through what we did not go through in 2008 because we were 17, 18 years old. So, um, <laughs> and we just weren't in business, right? We experienced it, but not at the level that you you definitely did. So I'm curious, what do you what is the what has changed? And this is more of like a personal question, but what has changed the most, or what has been the the biggest shift? That you've seen in the real estate business as a whole since you started, you know, through 2010, 15, 20, and up to now, and and the fact that you're still thriving means that you've been able to be, uh, I'll say it again, resilient enough to to withstand it. I'm just curious. You know what the market does doesn't matter. What matters is you, the real estate investor, adapting to the market, right? And so what, what do I mean by adapting to the market? Well, for example, if you are a real estate investor and you're going if, you, if you're going to buy some terms deals and buy subject to the existing note, it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what the, the market does. You know, sometimes people will say if you buy subject to the existing note and you put a tenant buyer in there, then what happens if the market changes and the values go down, right? And you know, you're upside down. It doesn't matter. Because if you're putting a tenant buyer in there, um, unfortunately, and I've even forced people into credit repair, but unfortunately, most of the time, the tenant buyer is not going to get their act together, right? And so it, it doesn't matter what the value of that house does. It's eventually going to come back anyway, right? Yep. 
So I've learned actually the if you're selling on terms, the longer you own a property, the more money you make, particularly if you're selling it on terms. So then somebody might say, well, Jay, why do you cash out? Well, it's just sort of hard to turn down 78,000 and 100,000 and 125,000 dollar profits. It'd take me a long time to earn that on if I'd sold that property, you know, on terms. So you mentioned a very, very important word, Corey, and that's the word resilience. And I tell you what, if, if anybody's gonna be in this business, you better be resilient because stuff is gonna happen. Stuff's gonna happen that you never anticipated happening. So I wanna share a formula with you that I learned from Jack Canfield. Jack Canfield was the co-author uh, of the Chicken uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul series of books. Oh, okay. I read oh, those millions books. and millions and millions and millions of books. And I've gotten to be around Jack uh, a couple of times, and he's a great guy. But here's Jack Canfield's formula for resilience, and here it is. The formula is E plus R equals O. E plus R equals O. Well, what's that stand for? The E stands for event. The R stands for response, and the O stands for outcome. Now, unfortunately, most people walking around in life are living life with a different formula. The formula they're living life is E equals O. Most people walking through life are letting the tide take them where the tide wants to take them, and whatever event comes along in their life, oh, that determines the outcome because I am a victim. That wasn't my fault. I couldn't do nothing about that. Mm. Poor, poor, pitiful me. Well, the Jack Canfield formula, E plus R equals O. You see, the event, you might not have had anything to do with the event, whatever that thing was that happened in your life. For example, when I was on the phone with Steve, my banker, I didn't have anything to do with losing my line of credit. I had an 800 credit score, never made missed out on payments. I did everything I was supposed to, kept my end of the deal, but here I have lost my line of credit. I didn't bring that event on. The global financial crisis did. But I tell you what I am 100% responsible for, and that's my response, my choice. How do I respond to the event that happened, right? That's, that's the wake-up call right there. It ain't what happened to you. It's your response to it. So... When Steve told me I'd lost my line of credit, well, I could have I could have put my tail between my legs and gone to the house, or I could I could look for another and better and quicker way to fund my deals. So what was my response? I picked up the phone and asked somebody that I knew who could help me with my problem. And so I talked with Jeff. So because of that conversation with Jeff, that was my response to the event and my outcome was a huge blessing in disguise. You see, I only had a million dollar line of credit at the bank when that event happened. But in less than 90 days, I had double that, $2,150,000 from the private lenders. And in that first 12 months after losing my line of credit all the way back in 2009, our business tripled. Our business tripled because we had all this funding, you know? Foreclosures were everywhere, and the banks were not lending money. But now I've got all this private money cash, and I was actually able to pick and choose the deals that I wanted to do. Right or downer, E plus R equals O. And a book I recommend that just came out by Dr. Benjamin Hardy about three or four years ago is amazing. Who, Not How. I bet you all have heard of that book. Yeah, Who, book right Not up. How, right? And that will put you in control and put you in the driver's seat of your destiny. Well, I love that. E plus R equals O. That is, uh, that's brilliant, and it's simple, and it really makes a lot of sense because I, we both have been there, Ryan and I have been pissed off about something and just taking it, you know, like give yourself three minutes to be mad and then figure out what your response is going to be, right? But like don't wait, you know, don't be mad for, for 10 days. It doesn't help anybody. So thank you. Thank you for that. Speaking of books, I want to talk about your book. You mentioned in the beginning. I'm not even sure if you mentioned the title, but I know that you have something for our listeners here, and, and your book is Where to Get the Money Now, great title, by the way, How and Where to Get Money for Your Real Estate Deals Without Relying on Traditional or Hard Money Lenders, and you're holding it up now if you're watching. So uh, 
talk about your book, talk about the inspiration to write it, and then talk about where people can, can access it. Sure. So the book, by the way, this is not downloadable. This is not an e-book. This is an actual book, book, book that I'll autograph and, and we'll ship it to you in the mail, three-day delivery. You can get it on Amazon for 20 bucks, but get it from me for free and just cover shipping and handling, and we'll ship it out to you priority mail. This book breaks it down super, super simple, step-by-step, how to get the private money chasing you instead of you having to chase any any money whatsoever. Think about how much more confident you're going to be when you make offers. And i tell you one thing, Corey and uh, Ryan, and for goodness sakes, forgive me if, uh, if I'm getting ready to say something that goes against what you teach. So I'm going to risk it, and here we go. Risk it. We uh, love it. Bring it on. <laughs> so what drives me nuts is the gurus and the real estate investing teachers out there that say, just get the deal under contract. The money will show up. I want to throw up. I want to go, where in the world is the money going to show up? Is it just like going to rain out of clouds or something? Right? No. So that's why I practice and I preach, get the money lined up first. Think about how much more confident, how many more offers you're going to make when you know you got the money burning a hole in your pocket. This book will show you simple step-by-step how to get at least $500,000 in private money lined up for you to use in less than 30 days. So here is the URL website. I will ship this to you, www.com. J Connor, and I'm an E-R, not an O-R, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R dot com forward slash book. That's jconnor.com, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R dot com forward slash book, and I'll ship it right out to you. Great. That's awesome. Uh, we appreciate you doing that for our audience, and you know, just to pay shipping and handling seems like a steal here. So, Jay, this has been um enlightening i i love your spirit i, I want to thank you for coming on i think this is uh you know just it's just you're just a fun conversation to have and i can tell that you know what you're talking about too so that doesn't hurt what's the um best way for people to get in touch with you maybe if they want to network they want to learn more about you they want to buy your book sure just go to jayconner.com j-a-y-c-o-n-n-e-r.com right there we got all of our contact information you know, we actually pick up the phone when somebody calls. I know that's like hard to believe, but we actually pick up the telephone. No, what's harder to believe is the phone that you just showed us. I don't know. I what I think it was was a corded phone, which I haven't seen in years. So thank you for, thank you for, uh, yeah, thank you for showing that to our audience. And that's uh, that's old school right there. Well, I tell you what, Corey, I, I just want to tell you I've enjoyed being with you and Ryan so much. I'm gonna do something for your audience. I got a three thousand dollar gift. A $3,000 gift, and here it is. I put on live in person three times a year the Private Money Academy Conference. Private Money Academy Conference. And uh, here's the URL. It's a $3,000 event. I'm going to give out a URL website right now to where your listeners can come for only a $97 registration fee. And the only reason we charge that is to save the seat so, you know, we're not kicking somebody else out from the event. But here's the URL for the $3,000 event for only a $97 registration fee, www.jaysliveevent.com, J-A-Y-S-L-I-V-E-E-V-E-N-T.com, jaysliveevent.com. And if anybody wants to hear more about private money just on podcast, just uh, look for my podcast on any of your podcast platforms at Raising Private Money. Imagine that. Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm super easy to find on the podcast apps. Well, listen, people, I think the proof is in the in the deals. You know, it's an average $70,000 per deal. Jay sounds like he knows what he's talking about, and I think he actually does. So you should check out his his book, his podcast, um, and any other ways to connect with him. Jay, this has been awesome, man. We want to thank you for coming on. I learned a lot today. I love that formula. We're gonna That one's going to stick in my brain for a while, and God knows we need it in this business. So thanks so mm-hmm. much for coming on. Corey, Ryan, thank you so much for having me on. God bless you. I hope to see you soon. Thanks for tuning in this week to the Weekly Juice Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and share with friends. The more ratings we get, the more ears we'll get on our show. And in turn, we'll be able to provide you with more high-quality guests. 
You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod, where we post daily tips and tricks and document our own journey towards financial freedom. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.